He's a bum. You want to see something funny? You go visit John Bender in five years. You'll see how goddamn funny he is. Today, we're going to analyze the character Richard Vernon from The Breakfast Club. I am a therapist. I've made videos breaking down the psychology of Alison, Andrew, Bender, Brian, and Claire in the past. And you know, it's obviously impossible to accurately analyze a fictional character. These videos are always a slightly doomed pursuit, but I do think it is still worth it because there is a lot we can take away. With Vernon, it's a little trickier because he isn't given the same depth the kids are in this film. We don't get to learn too much about his inner world, about his past or anything, because he more or less is serving a function in his story, which is to represent the adult world dismissing and judging the younger generation, I suppose you could say. As we know, that always happens. Every generation ever has bemoaned how the generation below them is becoming entitled or lazy or whatever else. And each year, these kids get more and more arrogant. And we don't see enough to fully understand that kind of perspective as displayed in this film, but that said, there's still a good amount we can get into that I think should be quite meaningful, hopefully. Um, and to begin, I think it's best to take a look at what I guess is Vernon's stereotype in this film, so let's get going. So this is a film all about the stereotypes that people have placed upon them and how the real people are much more complex than those stereotypes. Or archetypes. Um, the kids are far more complex than athlete, brain, princess, basket case and criminal. And I guess you could loosely say Vernon's stereotype is the self-absorbed teacher. Depending on whether or not you want to criticise the writing of his characterization or see it as meaningful, I think Vernon comes across as a little bit too dimensional. You see him somewhat strutting when he moves, looking at his reflection to declare Lots of finger clicking. He uses a hell of a lot of stock phrases. What do you think? I was born yesterday. My front and center. Let's go. Any monkey business is ill-advised. Don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. Okay, not all of them are stock phrases as such. Sometimes it's more, uh, I don't know the words, taking a circumstance and turning it into a phrase. Like when Bender says that a screw fell out of the door. The next screw that falls out is going to be you. Or asking the question if he raided Barry Manilow's wardrobe. Give you the answer to that question, Mr. Bender next Saturday. Which can be a very witty thing to do, but I think here it makes him feel less human. It's clear Vernon has fallen into a set of phrases and ways of speaking that he constantly repeats, enough for Bender to know them off by heart. The next time I have to come in here, I'm cracking skulls. It makes him less genuine and more just like this idea of a teacher who will always respond the same ways, regardless of how you try to interact with him. And there is some truth to that. Antagonise him and he'll say all of these sort of things try to connect with him, and at best it seems he'll completely ignore it. So how long have you been at Sherman, Mr. Vernon? Bring up the rear! Some of this is obviously played up a little bit for comedic effect. Um, the line about messing with the bull and getting the horns is my favourite, I think, because it comes with this hand gesture he repeats. A gesture I don't think he's using in that classic heavy metal devil context, so much as just trying to associate himself as the bull. It gives you this really fun feeling that Vernon so much wants people to start referring to him as the bull. Like kids would be talking like, oh, I've got to have detention with the bull this Saturday, <laughs> and you know they'll just have a billion names for him. None of them as kind as that. I'm very much over reading into this here, but it is still such a fun touch to the film. Um, okay, let me interrupt momentarily. Uh, sorry. Yes, World Anvil are still sponsoring me. This is a company I genuinely love. I'm going to keep promoting and supporting them as long as I physically can. <laughs> and all of you are going to listen intently. Um, World Anvil is an online tool for world building, character creation, story planning and writing, campaign building and playing lots of different games. A 
lot of useful stuff. I use it for my novel with the sprawling mess all of my world building turned into. And even just like, I was keen on my fictional town having a strong sense of community. So there was pages after page of who lives where, what do they think of their neighbours, where do they work, what are their opinions on local gossip. I don't know, a very big sprawling mess that World Anvil can really help to organise with hyperlinks, different categories, timelines. You can even completely build out of your own designed calendars. Again, with hyperlinks attached to other articles and a map to link the different timeline events to if you fancy that. When there is so much detail it is hard to remember it all and having something like this to just quickly glance at and see what happens where and when becomes so damn handy. And there are other tools as well I've not used all of them yet myself but all the ones I have used are pretty straightforward. They do have lots of tutorials for how to use everything but I've never needed to watch them I've just figured it out myself pretty easily. There is a link in the description and as a pinned comment, there is the code TREE, which entitles you to 40% off any of their yearly subscriptions. And if you want to try it out first, they have a free version. Test that out for as long as you like first. Get familiar with World Anvil. You know, if you're interested, click the link. World Anvil. Anyway, yeah, uh, this is the initial idea we're given of Vernon. A teacher far more caught up in their image and how they present themselves to these kids than in actually connecting to them. That's why he repeats all of these lines, because he thinks they're good things to say. He must have said them once, thought, ah, this was right, I'm going to say this again in the future. He thinks they sound good, make him look good, help build up this image as some cool but also really tough, slick teacher. You think I give one rat's ass with these? kids think of me. Yes, I do. Of course he cares. He criticises Bender in particular multiple times, I think, about trying to impress others, which feels a little like projection. You ought to spend a little more time trying to do something with yourself and a little less time trying to impress people. He declares, I will not be made a fool of. That's the last time you ever make me look bad in front of those kids, do you hear me? Of course he cares. He cares so deeply it leads him down the detrimental road of competing with Bender to be the one who looks good. One of them gets to impress the kids and come away looking good, while the other is made a fool of. He goes to battle with Bender over that, and of course he loses. I find this line interesting. I'm a man of respect around here. They love me around here. I'm a swell guy. Yeah, I don't believe for a second he is a man of respect, exactly. Carl certainly doesn't seem to love him, but Vernon wants to believe that people do because it feeds this image he has. And that's easier with adults, I think, but the problem with the kids who are regularly so blatant in their dislike of him, partly because they're kids, partly because of how he antagonises them, they're the ones that puncture this image as a swell guy, for which he declares... These kids turned on me. They think I'm a big fucking joke. I think there's a part of Vernon that blames them for puncturing this image, resents them for it. So yeah, Vernon is very keen that they respect him and feeds this image of the bull. Um, I'm using the bull, I'm making too big a thing out of that. That's more an example. Um, when they don't respect him, he is unable to tolerate it, for which he then either engages in battle to come out on top or finds a way to project it onto someone else. Like there's this bit with Andy I find so interesting in that sense. Vernon wants the door to stay open so that he can see them, but the chair is too light to hold it open. He gets Andy to help him move this shelf until Bender points out, But what if there's a fire? <laughs> but he can't stomach to say, okay, that's a good point, or even to take a moment and stop and think it through, because he's in danger of looking a bit silly here, so he immediately attacks Andrew for it. What are you doing with this? What are you doing with it? Get this out of here for God's sake. I expected a little more from a varsity letterman. Andrew literally just did what you told him to do. You know, he's hoping in attacking Andrew he can save some bit of face here. Why then is Vernon so keen on his image? Um, well, that's something the film doesn't really provide an answer to. I know the thing people would jump to say is that Vernon's a narcissist, but I don't know, I don't think there's enough evidence for us to say that. People chuck out the phrase narcissist so freely nowadays. We can't concretely say. If I was to speculate, something or rather, I would say he's a man who's dissatisfied with his life. You see a lot more of his dissatisfaction in the deleted scenes. Um, he clearly didn't want to ever really become a teacher. I probably shouldn't assume like this, but the line about his home and money with no mention of a partner makes me think he might be single. I make $31,000 a year and I've got a home and I'm not about to throw it away on some punk like you. Or at least there's no point in this film of him warmly mentioning anyone from his social circle. No scene of him using the office phone to call someone when he gets bored. His days are spent 
wasn't being humiliated and shamed and made to feel like a villain by the many students who hate him. He seems discontented with how quickly he's growing old. It's not surprising image matters to him in that way. What else has he got? Which again, he might have a lot else, but we don't see it in the film. Um, but we can talk empathetically about how Claire's image or Alison's are partly defences. Why not Vernon's too? The trouble of it is, I suppose, it's a defence that's causing him a lot of problems for how it uh, exacerbates the disconnect between teacher and student. Let's talk a little more about that disconnect though, because there's something I just said there that is only one side of the story, and we do need to consider the other side too. So I said his days are spent being humiliated and shamed and made to feel like a villain by the many students that hate him. We can't forget he is spending his days humiliating and shaming and making them feel like villains. Most obviously with Bender, yes, he does a lot of horrible things throughout this film. And also some lesser examples towards the other kids, like that having a go at Andrew over nothing, telling Brian to shut up Pee Wee, shutting down Brian's attempts to engage in a way that might make Brian and feel beneath him, the way he speaks to Allison here. You. Hey. What's her name? Wake her, wake her up. Hey, come on, on your feet. If this is an example of the ways they are treated and spoken to day in, day out, then it's going to start to feel pretty dehumanizing. I always say this, we can empathize without excusing behavior, and this is deeply unacceptable behaviour from a teacher that can be deeply damaging to kids. He threatens to assault Bender, locks him in a storeroom, tries to provoke him into fighting, and then calls him a gutless turd when Bender won't. These are not good things, uh, to put it lightly. And in general about shame, children naturally tend to be more susceptible to the effects of shame, something I talk about a lot in my therapy case study series on the child Katie. I won't dwell on it here, we just needed to point that out so that we can also then say, this this is kind of what can tend to happen with shame in a school system. This is where things like projection and countertransference can have a huge effect, as these feelings of shame become like a cloud that floats over everything. To take Bender as one example, put through abuse at home, made to feel weak and worthless and shamed, made to internalise that, carry it around, no doubt there's trauma. Inevitably some of that will then either get picked up or placed onto others around him, such as Vernon in one example. He seems to feel it, humiliated, ridiculed by these students. Such a palpable feeling of shame that he might partly introject, and it probably taps into whatever experiences of shame he himself had growing up, making it feel twice as intense. You know, this is one of the reasons bad kids can sometimes get so easily dismissed as just bad people. Because the feelings of shame they have inside are just too unbearable for some to even want to recognise, so they might just say that they're a bad kid and leave it at that. Even if they consciously understand that this is a child who has been through a lot, they don't emotionally empathise with that because it's too much, you know? So Vernon is then also projecting all of his shame back onto the students and you end up with this unhealthy cycle of shame where, from Vernon's perspective, these kids are villains that humiliate him and it is his right to teach them manners and from their perspective, he is this villain trying to humiliate them. Look, I'm interrupting here while in the edit because the point that I hope my wording didn't underemphasize just then is that these children are vulnerable people, making them very easy targets and I guess receptacles for a lot of shame that Vernon does pour onto them. Yes, from Vernon's perspective he probably does feel humiliated by them and it probably taps into a lot of his own past experiences that we learn nothing about in this film, but objectively the point still stands, these are vulnerable people that he is abusing. We should make clear there is a big difference between a burned out teacher who gets caught up in these kind of dynamics and someone who goes several steps further to locking students in cupboards, threatening to fight them, goes through confidential records. It's just the fact that we are shown not a great deal of psychological depth to pick apart with Vernon, which partly leaves me to veer into discussing just the external factors. And so it's important that nobody takes those external factors as the whole picture. Yeah, Vernon isn't this way just because of the culture of the system. He is also 
also partly that way himself and the culture here just allows him freedom to indulge in his worst behaviours. So it probably was unnecessary for me to add all that in, I just didn't like the way I worded it. So there you go, back to the video. The problem is one, there's no real regulation or support to stop him doing that, and two, the worse he behaves, the harder it does then become to empathise with these kids. Because if he didn't see them like villains or arrogant shits who need to be taught a lesson, if he saw them as human, he'd then have to recognise how horrible he's treated them at times. That they didn't deserve his treatment, and then, yeah, he'd be left to feel guilt about that and shame. Far less painful to double down on the resentment and decide that they deserve it. So I guess this is the thing I never discuss enough in any of my character analyses. Films give us a snapshot of characters at specific points or situations in their lives. This means sometimes their behaviour isn't all rooted in psychology. Often that's a part of it, yes, but sometimes people are also put in abnormal situations that draw out sides of them they wouldn't show otherwise. And that might be the case with Vernon. Might. We don't know. He could be exactly like this outside of teaching, before he got into teaching, whenever. Maybe. Um, but this is also a good opportunity to point out that sometimes external factors do play a role. Um, this certainly doesn't function as an excuse, but hopefully we can also recognise a problem that goes beyond him, such as how a culture of shame can take roots in an education system and affect the people working within it. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. Um, Let's move on. One of my favourite Vernon moments in the film is after he keeps escalating all of these detentions for Bender. Well, that's a good bit in itself. Bender questions him, so Vernon threatens him with another detention next Saturday, and then keeps threatening them, trying to force Bender to back down and lose this very defence-driven battle of theirs. Which of course helps no one, you know, neither of them want to be spending their Saturdays with each other. But after this happens, just as Vernon is walking out of the door, Bender calls out... And Vernon very much hears it, sighs, and chooses to pretend that he didn't hear it, because otherwise it would mean having to go back in there and battling even more when he's exhausted, I think. But he seems either left to go in and escalate with full aggression, or to ignore it, which leads to really inconsistent boundaries. Which as a tangent, something people who always complain about modern teaching as molly coddling kids and all of that stuff, people who talk up discipline, that's something that never gets mentioned. Sometimes they're so keen on such big punishments that the discipline is going to inevitably end up really inconsistent. For which should be loads better with minor but very consistent consequences. Um, not that I'm going to get into all of that, there are other problems. You can watch like my Katie series or videos like this one if you want more thoughts there. Um, I reckon a lot of teachers could probably empathise with wanting to just turn a blind eye to certain bad behaviour at times. When you're spending every day having to maintain boundaries and challenge kids, it could be exhausting. And Vernon must be absolutely exhausted. Can you imagine how often he ends up in big battles like this one over a kid's behaviour? You know, Vernon is not that one strict teacher who no one dared to challenge. He's too aggressive, he provokes them too much, and it leads to big arguments which must be exhausting for him. To get caught in them time and time again, over and over, tiring, infuriating, probably makes him resent the kids even more for how his threats don't seem to stop them, and how he doesn't get to feel powerful as a result and in command, therefore resulting in him only being more aggressive, and then even more resentful when it still doesn't work. Vernon's biggest mistake in this film was not staying in the room. Definitely. <laughs> Do you really expect a bunch of kids to be able to sit still in total silence for an entire day? Especially when you're not even there. And then when the door is closed and he realises that he can't prop it open, he still chooses not to stay in the room with them. As a result, A, they're free to mostly do what they like, and B, he denies himself any chance to actually form a connection with them. His office is his safe space, no one can pick on him there or make him feel bad at his job. He doesn't have to fight battles there, so he stays put. Which is then also perhaps another reason he's so aggressive, because not actually being there to keep them in check via supervision, he is having to make a massive show of threats in the hope that they will do the job for him. Look, the point I was leading towards is that Vernon is so clearly a teacher in need of support. He doesn't know the best way to do things, he's gotten stuck into unhealthy dynamics, he's burned out, worn down, afraid to challenge behaviour for which he either then hides away 
or comes out in full force, and that all might be a very charitable interpretation of Vernon on my behalf. We don't know, we don't see enough about him to be clear. But school kids can be super difficult, because yeah, they're still learning how to channel their emotions, meaning they can frequently become dysregulated. They're still making sense of like how social interactions work. There's what teachers can tend to represent towards children. There's the faint effects of mob mentality in certain situations. It can all be really, really hard. You're trying to get children to do things that they normally don't want to do. I think good teachers need humility, because there will be times, inevitably, regardless of anything whatsoever, where kids kids might, like, poke fun at you, or where you won't look good because the younger generation wants to think of themselves as cool and you as a bit old and weird and out of touch, or where they won't look up to you where there are natural disagreements, or where you do get things a bit wrong, or whatever it is. Sometimes they're projections of their own. Um, so when Vernon doesn't seem to have much humility, that can make 22 years of this an absolute nightmare that will bring out the very worst in him. The second you expect school children to act like mature, responsible adults in every single situation is the second that teaching is going to become endlessly disappointing and frustrating for you. In an ideal world, I think Vernon would sit in a room with the kids at a table, maybe just slightly away, either working himself or reading. He would give the kids breaks to move about, get some energy out of them that will help them stay calmer when they do have to get back to working. He'd give them something a bit clearer to do, or at least give them more direction about it and yeah give them all set times to chat and for him to join in and learn a little bit more about them if he absolutely needed to to help them reflect in a positive way like this might not be a great example but i can remember in an old different job i had to run a few detentions in a school i can remember a kid who got in trouble in a science lesson and was saying like he didn't care science is boring rubbish what's the point in it but then how very quickly when you just talk to him and give him a bit of space he starts to realize that it isn't that it's boring, it's that he found it difficult. He struggled with it, and that made him feel stupid, and then want to give up and kick off. And that then opens the door to ask him what could be done to make it a bit easier, a bit less frustrating, or to suggest things, and suddenly you have a dialogue. I don't know, I, I guess the point of me bringing that up is um, because Vernon was almost doing something interesting with this detention. Almost. Write an essay about who they think they are. It's not great, because he has no interest in who they are. It's meant to be punitive. He's wanting them to, like, sit and reflect and feel bad about themselves, which obviously wouldn't help anything. He gives them this assignment and then walks off and never once offers help or shows an interest in how they're getting on. Um, also, it could be a painfully exposing thing to make a kid do. But reflect on who they are is exactly what these characters do together through conversation and empathy and connection. It turns out to be a really positive experience for them. And it's also fun because the essay Brian writes serves instead to actually make Vernon reflect on who he thinks he is. Um, at least I imagine it makes him reflect. He takes time reading it. He seems to be reflecting, as is supported, I think, by this interview with Paul Gleason himself. Uh, an awakening, a kick in the eye. He's supposed to realize something uh, about the fact that he has let these kids down. I think he takes away some understanding from his talk with Carl as well. Um, actually a deleted scene that I can see why they cut but I also quite like. When it comes to the end of detention, Vernon is in his office checking his watch, then he says I hope they take it easy on me. Which has a nice implication. It's not so much I hope they don't behave like such shits when I go see them, but take it easy on me, implying that he hasn't been the best to them. Um, there's just a little sense of him starting to recognise his own behaviour and how it might affect them. I like that. He gets his growth too. So I guess that's this video. Um, it has been lighter on the psychology and heavier on the long tangents about education. That is partly because we are shown less depth to this character, so forgive that. I hope it was still interesting. Um, hopefully Richard Vernon is a product of his time. Hopefully similar teaching wouldn't be allowed to happen nowadays, but I don't know everything. Let me know what I've missed, what I've explained badly, gotten wrong, whatever else. Something I wanted to include that is faded out in the film but you can hear clear in the deleted scenes is this little muttering from Vernon after he spills his coffee. Everything's polluted, the coffee, the food, the kids are polluted. I'll finish it here though. Uh, like the video if you liked it. Subscribe, support me on Patreon. I might talk about Carl, I just don't know yet because that video might be so damn short. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> Hopefully see you next time. And as ever, a special thank you guys to Luke Kaur, Tree Tree Caber, Michael Gallagher, Flying Spider, Kellyanne Davidson, Billy Lee Myers Jr., Samara Salsi, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramhall, and Michael Hart. Thank you.